least one of my colleagues from MPI said she was coming. Who is that? Natalia Bogdan. You make a good deal. That's, That's a great, great idea. idea. We'll see you next time. something like this in the middle of the morning in Washington, but <laughs> clearly it works somehow. Well, you know, when you guys a usually lot do. of people whose jobs uh, are going to things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. So there, yeah. you know, well, you, if you did something in the middle of the morning in Dallas, nobody would show up. It has to be over lunch or after after working hours are over. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's true of most of the, you know, councils on foreign relations and so on, but here, you know, between the sort of academic and think tank audiences yeah. and some, you know, government people who are following this portfolio. Embassies. Um, About 150, <laughs> 150 people signed up. Oh, these lights oh, are strong. We typically find we get about half of those. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I, I, I think that is it being television watched? requires. Them. Yes, it is. Yeah. So people and that's watch a lot it. of people watch it in their offices. They were very excited to have C-SPAN come, but this is, I think this is a, um, uh, you know, they, they one of the things they want here is maximum media coverage. Sure. And they do. Part of the think tank world. I think think tank world. Well, I've <coughs> never, I've never really worked in a think tank, so I don't, I don't know the routine that well. Well, it's interesting, you know. It's a lot. Media coverage is a lot of that. Think tanks measure their impact. Yeah. It's yeah. It's a lot. Impact. So, you know, it's a sort of property for impact. Mm -hmm. It's not really clear. Well, apparently the new leadership here is... from the Central Agency in the United States. The new leadership here counts every hit for everything. Yeah. And that's the... Well, we do too. And you do the same thing. We do. It's well, you know, the center that I have been running for 15 years, 16 years, is, uh, you know, it's an academic center. The coin of the realm there is, you know, getting publications and right. things like that. Journal articles and mm -hmm. presentations and so on. Okay, let's see what we got here. Ready, Emily? <coughs> okay, well, <coughs> let me uh, first of all welcome you to the Wilson Center here this morning. Uh, my name is James Hollifield, and I am a public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the center, uh, but my uh, normal job is in Texas, where I'm a professor of political science and director of the Tower Center at SMU in Dallas. And it's really uh, a nirvana for uh, scholars like me to come, be able to come and spend uh, uh, quality time here at the Wilson Center. So this is uh, my sabbatical year, and I'm delighted to be here. 
Uh, I would like it if everybody just take a moment and silence your phones so that we, we can avoid uh, phone interruptions if possible. So um, again, let me welcome you to the Wilson Center and uh, point out that the Wilson Center was chartered by Congress as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. <clears throat> it is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for Congress, the administration, and the broader policy community. Uh, today we are going to look at Europe's refugee challenge, uh, a response to an international crisis, and I should point out that the program today is co-hosted by several different programs here at the Wilson Center. In addition to the Global Europe program, which is the primary sponsor, uh, it is also um, sponsored by the Middle East program. Uh, this crisis has its origins in part in the Middle East and also by the Global Sustainability and Resilience programs. Um, this is, as I'm sure all of you are aware, an incredibly difficult moment uh, in time. <clears throat> the conflicts and violence uh, that have been raging across uh, what someone, I believe it was Big Brzezinski, called the arc of instability, uh, running from roughly from West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, all the way uh, to South Asia and the Asian subcontinent. Um, I have said that this is a multi-level crisis. Uh, it is first and foremost a humanitarian crisis, some would say a humanitarian disaster. Uh, you've got in many countries in Europe 10,000 people a day arriving at the border. Uh, we're looking at roughly a million refugees coming this year, maybe more. Uh, with no end in sight. So the question is, how do you cope with this? Uh, what are the moral and legal commitments uh, that we have in the West uh, to deal with this kind of exodus? Um, and of course, this is a tremendous political and policy challenge. It's also a crisis, I would argue, of governance uh, for Europe uh, and for the world community. Uh, we are very lucky today to have a distinguished panel of experts. I'm going to just briefly introduce them. I know a lot of you have their bios in front of you, uh, but for those uh, who are watching online uh, or watching this broadcast, uh, I just want to say a few words about them and then we're going to go uh, straight to the panel. Just so you understand, uh, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, each of them will make uh, brief uh, remarks. Um, then I will have a couple of rounds of questions with them, a little dialogue with the panel, and then I'm going to open it up uh, for your questions. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to introduce Philip Ackerman, uh, someone I have gotten to know quite well in the brief time he's been in the United States. Uh, he is sitting uh, just to the left of Kathleen Newland, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, Philip is the Minister and Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany in Washington, D.C., basically the number two German diplomat in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> looking at his bio, you may be surprised to find out that he's a high-level diplomat who has a Ph.D. in art history <laughs> from Bonn University, so, uh, <laughs> which is great training, I suspect, uh, to be a diplomat. Uh, the other things I want to highlight about him is uh, he headed... Uh, the German task force for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, so he has a deep involvement in South Asia. We all know Afghanistan is one of the sources, prime sources, for refugees coming to Europe. Uh, among other things, Philip worked as the speechwriter uh, for uh, two foreign ministers, Joschka Fischer and Frank-Walter Steinmeier. Uh, and he oversaw the political department of the German embassy in New Delhi in India. So a lot of deep experience in South Asia. Uh, secondly, I want to introduce the gentleman sitting just to his left, who is Charles Gatti. Uh, he is a senior research professor of European and Eurasian studies at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He has worked uh, on the policy planning staff of the U.S. Department of State, uh, published many books, uh, including uh, Failed Illusions, Moscow, Washington, Budapest, and the 1956 Hungarian Revolt and also Hungary and the Soviet bloc. So 
Uh, since Hungary has been very much at the center of this crisis, uh, he will have something to say about the Hungarian position and the Hungarian role. Uh, I might just conclude uh, my introduction of him by pointing out that he's got a new book that just came out called Zbig, <laughs> which is the strategy and statecraft of Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, sitting next to his left is Captain Brian Lisko, who is a senior U.S. Coast Guard liaison to the Department of State, uh, where he serves in the Maritime Security Division of the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. Uh, he is a career aviator, a very decorated uh, flyer. Uh, among other things, he has served uh, with the Sixth Fleet in Naples, Italy, and a liaison, this is very important, to the European Border Control Agency uh, Frontex. So uh, he has a lot of frontline experience looking at what's going on uh, in North and West Africa, the Middle East, uh, the Mediterranean, and many of the frontline European states. Uh, finally, and then we're going to segue to the panel, uh, I want to introduce Kathleen Newland, someone whose work I have known for many, many years and followed her, her career, uh, but actually we've never met until, uh, until today, ironically, even though both of us have spent much of our career and lifetime working on this issue of migration. She is a senior fellow and co-founder of the Migration Policy Institute. Among other things, she sits on the board of overseers of the International Rescue Committee. Many of you in this room probably know the IRC. She's on the board of directors of USA for UNHCR. Uh, she is on the foundation for the Hague process of migrants and refugees, worked for the UNHCR, the World Bank, the Secretary General. Uh, I thought it was interesting that she co-founded an organization called Humanitas uh, with Lord David Owen uh, in London. Uh, she is the author of many, many, many books. Uh, I'm not going to uh, list them all, uh, but we're going to start. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Newland. And I just want to ask her if she could help us understand the nature and the origins of this crisis and give us some historical perspective on this. So Kathleen, let's start with you. Thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Jim, and thank you all uh, for coming. I'm looking forward to this discussion very much. Um, I really want to start uh, where uh, Jim started, and that is with the multi-dimensional nature of this crisis. And as you were, as you started your comments, I thought, there goes my introduction. <laughs> but um, but uh, since since you were uh, so brief, I think I can elaborate a little, um, reiterating that this is a humanitarian crisis. It's a legal and policy crisis, especially for European states. It's a political crisis, both for individual countries and at the EU level, which makes it also a solidarity crisis, but not just at the EU level, also in the region and globally, uh, I think. And I, I suspect that's something we'll get into in the discussion. Um, on the humanitarian crisis, uh, I think the um, more even than the numbers, which as you know are extremely high, surpassing probably, you know, on. <laughs> The number changes daily in quite big ways. But more than 750,000 people have arrived in Europe by sea so far this year. The October total of people arriving was higher than the total for all of last year. Mm. So I think the, you know, the problem is not just the number, but the pace. And that is what is overwhelming the capacity uh, in, in European countries to receive people in a humane way. Uh, so far this year, we're approaching 3,500 deaths at sea, um, which is uh, will come out probably at about the same total as last year of deaths of sea, but on a much larger base of people moving. So the death rates have actually gone down, and I think that is a real tribute to the rescue at sea effort that the European countries and others, including the U.S., have mounted. And I know Brian's going to uh, maybe talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other problem, in addition to the pace, is that there is no end in sight, and I think this has a, is inducing a real sort of existential panic in, in the humanitarian uh, response uh, system. Uh, not only is there no end in sight, but there is every reason to believe that the pace will continue or indeed accelerate with the um, 
advent of, of Russian bombing um, and the, the um, destabilization of front lines around Aleppo, more people are fleeing into Turkey. And from there, uh, there's every reason to expect that they will try to move on. They, um, I had uh, a long conversation yesterday with the UNHC, the head of UNHCR operations in Jordan, and he said people are people are leaving, not because they're starving, not because of cuts in World Food Program allocations, although you know that's a factor, but because they are in despair and they they demand uh, of themselves that they try to find a prospect for their families and for their futures. And uh, they don't see that prospect in uh, in Jordan which, or Lebanon, which won't allow them to work, uh, in Turkey, where work opportunities are very restricted, and and so on. So that's you know the humanitarian crisis, the legal and policy crisis in Europe, um, is you know in the face of this kind of pace and these numbers, how do European countries meet their legal obligations under the 1951 Refugee Convention? Um, how do they do it in the face of these of these numbers? With um, at least uh, you know Sweden is expecting twice the number of asylum seekers this year that it had last year, which is twice the number that they had the year before. I mean, there's been an exponential growth and um, a, a real policy crisis around how to deal with this number of asylum seekers. Let's not forget that not everyone is a Syrian who's coming into Europe. That's a very important uh, point. About three quarters of the sea arrivals to Greece are Syrian. Uh, the next largest number are from Afghanistan, which as you know is being deeply destabilized. Uh, and then Pakistan, uh, Somalia, Iraq, and, and some others. The sea arrivals to Italy, which everyone, which is out of the headlines now, uh, people tend to forget about it, are much more from sub-Saharan Africa, only about 5% from Syria. Mm. Um, so how do you deal with this? That's the legal and the policy crisis. Uh, the political crisis, you're well aware of the rise of the, the right in individual countries, um, not all countries in Europe, thankfully, but even within the countries that have been most generous uh, both Sweden and Germany, the most generous, have toughened up their asylum policies and, and practices in, in recent weeks. Um, and uh, that reflects, I think, the, the solidarity crisis within the, within the EU, where a real two-track EU is, is emerging um, with uh, Britain, Denmark, and the uh, Central European countries being extremely uh, resistant to any form of burden sharing uh, with the other countries and um, the, the burden falling most heavily on uh, Sweden, Germany, uh, Austria, uh, and a few others. So a multi-level crisis. Let me just leave you with a question. Do we need new institutions, new processes, new laws, uh, new international agreements? Um, I don't think we need new laws, but on the others, I would say absolutely yes. Clearly, what we have in place now is not um, is not working satisfactorily. We need to, because it's mostly aimed at a short-term response, at an emergency response, at sort of care and maintenance of refugees, and we need to think about this long term. We need to look at the potential contributions of these people, not just at the immediate burden that they result. So European demographics, um, looking at the pattern that leaves people with no alternative to smuggling routes, so labor mobility and uh, so on, these uh, family reunification. These are the kind of big I long-term ideas we need to be thinking about. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I want to quickly segue to our German uh, representative here and ask him to talk a little bit about the German and, and the European response. Thanks, Jim, and thank you for having us here today. Um, thanks for uh, introducing me so kindly. You know, you see from my weird uh, CV that I'm certainly not an expert on immigration, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the German experience right now. Um, let me make six short points. The first one is um, uh, numbers are very difficult um, right now. Um, um, we have a, a rough estimate. Um, what we hear from, from our... Um, 
of administration back home is that this, so far 710,000 people have uh, asked for protection, asylum and others in Germany. And we have about uh, this year, now we're talking 2015, and we have about seven to 10,000 a day coming into Germany every day. 80% um, of them are Syrians, Afghans and Iraqis. 20% um, are from elsewhere. We have Eritreans, we have Pakistanis, as you said, Kathleen, but we have also Nigerians all of a sudden coming um, hmm. and others. Um, um, but 80% are from these three, three countries. Um, um, and it's not stopping. We've, we, we somehow hoped, actually, that you know, the winter will slow, would slow down a bit the, 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 the inflow, but the fact is that it is not happening. Partly also because um, there is um, um, a very um, uh, unfortunate human traffickers um, uh, situation that you know says you know, Germany is closing the borders. You better get in, uh, to Germany now, um, uh, otherwise you won't get you get the chance. So um, um, that, that's the situation as we as we see it right now. I think we expect this year between 800,000 to 1 million refugees um, in Germany alone. That would be like <laughs> if 5 million people from Mexico would come to the United yeah, States in, yeah. in a year's time. Yeah. Um, second point is um, we have to admit that our administration is not laid out to, to cope with this flow. I mean, we have a very, you know, you might imagine cliche, <laughs> the German administration, very solid, but it's also not very flexible and it's um, we have to I mean they are really stretched all our all, all institutions are really stretched and I think it's fair to say that without the help of the civil society the institutionalized civil society and individuals we wouldn't have coped with the the, um, the, 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 the influx of migrants so far it's quite amazing to see I say that with all my modesty that somehow it works you know I mean these people yeah. get some shelter and and it's, it's thanks to many, many individuals. I hear, I hear heard that 50% of Germans somehow, you know, are involved in this refugee um, crisis, you know, and be it only by giving some clothes. Um, but but, but um, the population is really taking, uh, 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 contributing to that. Um, third point, and that's a point which um, we hear very often in America, it's uh, what do you think about the security? Now, um, <laughs> Um, the, um, it, uh, frankly, this is not our first priority in this case. We are not in, we don't have the privilege to vet the people who come, unlike you. Uh, um, we, they, st they are there. They come, they stand at Munich main station all of a sudden. Um, but we feel that, you know, the, the danger of an infiltration through terrorists or by terrorists <coughs> is, is not the biggest problem. We are pretty sure that there are a couple of bad guys amongst them. But, you know, we have, a, an, an, uh, unfortunately, we have experience with um, Muslim extremism in Germany. We have about 750 foreign fighters from German origin or living in Germany moved to Syria and fought there. So, so this is something where we have a sort of an experience with and we can cope with this. Our problem when it comes to security is to teach those people to... Um, to live or to abide, by our, to abide by our laws. I mean, the rules of our society, the, how to learn that, you know, kids, boys and girls are co-educated in Germany, how to to make them understand that alcohol is part of our culture, how to um, make them understand that freedom re of religion is a, a, a fundamental right of every person, um, and that, um, let's say, homosexuals are part of our society, and the, there's nothing wrong about them. This kind of, you know, this is a security problem, because that leads to aggressions and tensions, and uh, this is, I think, a much more important problem to cope with than the the sort of terrorism uh, idea what one has. Mm -hmm. um, um, my, my, my fourth point is, um, and that's perhaps the, we have to observe that very, very, um, very clearly, is the mood point. I mean, how is the population reacting so far? And we, you have seen in summer, during the summer, the wel welcome in Germany uh, signs at Munich main stations where people came and handed out diapers and little stuffed animals. And, uh, this certainly is not as you know, um, strong as it used to be. I think we still have a very, very um, contributing, extremely um, helpful civil society, but more and more people ask questions. And um, you have seen the, the polls of our otherwise very popular chancellor dropping um, in, in the last uh, couple of months. Um, and people are feel threatened. I, not that they really experience bad things. We have uh, the crime rate has not gone up in the last month, but they are threatened in their Lifestyles, not least because, you know, in 
you know, there is a, a the, the very famous village of Zumte in northern Germany, which um, which has a hundred inhabitants. All of a sudden, gets seven hundred fifty refugees because there is some empty building next door, and they can fill it with refugees. So these people are exposed to seven hundred fifty Syrians, Afghans, um, Iraqis, and they feel somehow you know uneasy and not comfortable. And this is something we have to. Um, we have to observe very closely and we have to deal with that and our politicians have to. Um, I have to say at the same time that other than, um, or unlike other European countries, Germany so far has not had the big populist um, right-wing movement. And uh, we have um, a small party that now has seven, eight, nine percent, which is very anti-immigration. We have demonstrations in some part of the country every Monday where 8,000 people go on the street and demonstrate and um, are getting lots of attention. But, you know, overall, that's fairly um, normal in a way. You know, I mean, I've, I'm very surprised that it, it's not not um, more controversial. Um, mm -hmm. And and I have to say that something which I found quite remarkable, I came from a breakfast with Dieter Zetsche, who is the CEO <laughs> of Mercedes-Benz, uh, the big uh, car company, <laughs> in this very building. And he said that um, this refugee influx to Germany is a huge opportunity. He says that this might cause a second economic miracle. Mm. So he says in very openly um, that they expect, I mean, they are totally firm. Um, they stand firm on the side of the chancellor. I mean, they support her 100 percent. And Mercedes goes actively to the shelters and asks whether they have welders or you know, <laughs> technicians. And they really integrate them from the very mo uh, beginning in their in their um, procedures. Even, he says, they vacate buildings in order to shelter refugees. So the German business is very, very optimistic about that. Mm -hmm. Unlike the public mood, I think business mood is better. Mm. Okay, great. And my, my last point is, um, uh, and this is the question, I think, the big, <laughs> the big elephant in the room, <laughs> Kathleen, I mean, what, what are we going to do? Because one thing is clear, it can't go f like this for another year. We will not be ha able to handle that for another year. We have to find a solution on how, yeah. to, how to deal with it. Now, we have a couple of tools here, and I think um, Europe and the federal government um, are um, working on that. And um, uh, we have, uh, you have seen, um, we, have we have been speaking to Turkey. Um, there are now little signs of hope in, when it comes to Syria and on a diplomatic level. Um, we have trying to set up hotspots for registration when people come to Europe. But um, all this is a start, and it will not change um, the influx the day after tomorrow. I mean, we have to make mm -hmm. clear that this is not going to change things very quickly. So we feel that at the end of the day, um, we need more European solidarity. Uh -huh. yeah? We need more European solidarity in this. Um, and you mentioned that Austria and Sweden, I think you should really mention them both because they per capita, they take even more than Germany, both smaller countries population-wise, but they have been extremely uh, generous, both countries, but others have le been less generous. And I think that, that, that at a certain <laughs> moment, we have to find ways and means to, okay. to get to a solution. Well, on that note, uh, talking about European solidarity, um, there has been uh, tremendous resistance uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, to this. The uh, Hungarians leading the, the way. So I, w I would like for Charles Gatti to talk to us a little bit about what's going on in Eastern Europe and, and why are the East Europeans so reluctant to, to pitch in and help with this crisis? Uh, <coughs> Thank you very much. I can't help uh, but note after uh, uh, the last uh, presentation that uh, whatever one's view used to be of Germany after or during and after World War II, for that matter, before World War II, this is not truly over. Uh, Germany has emerged as the most humane uh, country uh, in Europe, and I have nothing but admiration for Chancellor Merkel and those who support, support her. And I, I think you should be very proud of your country, Thank sir. You. <laughs> uh, the second point I'd like to make as a way of introduction is to... Uh, uh, to note, to recall that I'm a, I, I was once a refugee myself mm, mm. Uh, <laughs> many decades ago, more than five decades ago, and that um, I, I was welcomed in Austria, and then I was welcomed very warmly in the United States, mm, for which mm. I'm grateful. <laughs> and on the way coming here from Europe at that time, I was sponsored by the International Rescue Committee, so I would like to, uh, I'd like to mention that, uh, that I have uh, 
I have repaid the cost of transportation many, many <laughs> times. <laughs> uh, and I'm certainly very pleased that you work there and doing the work you are doing. Um, let me start out by saying that I had a student uh, visiting with me the other day and uh, uh, complaining about the bad relationship between Europe and the United States, including <coughs> America's uh, uh, seemingly lack of interest in the refugee crisis. And so I, uh, we were talking about the uh, transatlantic relations, not about the EU. Excuse me. <coughs> At that point, and I said, I said to him that um, this is hardly new. And I, <laughs> I looked on my bookshelves, and there was a book there, uh, a little book called Atlantic Crisis, published in 1966. Mm, mm. <coughs> Nothing is new under the sun. Mm -hmm. What is new is Germany's uh, <laughs> uh, rise as, uh, as, as a humane country and as a humane society. Otherwise, the differences, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, are, not, are not new. Now, as for the, um, the European Union, I think it is important to state again, it's a miracle that it has lasted as long as it has and that it continues to work. Not as well as some of us would like. Uh, the crises are, uh, you know, every year, you know, we just had Greece, the extraordinary problems uh, that the EU has had with enlargement. Uh, uh, when before admitting, uh, uh, admitting that all of these countries offered very good cooperation, but once they became members, they could not be influenced, as we now see in the case of not just Hungary, but in Estonia, uh, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Romania, uh, 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 actually all of them. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So the real question here is <coughs> why is the European Union constantly facing such uh, major uh, uh, crises? And I'd like to call your attention very briefly in outline form to four uh, points here. Uh, one is nationalist resistance. This is not only in Eastern Europe, it is everywhere. Um, the fact of the matter is that most people identify themselves by their national identity rather than as Europeans. This has been there, it has not changed very much. In other words, the culture uh, 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 follows uh, very good institution building and follows, follows it very slowly. The second is that the European Union has always been an elite uh, project. Uh, if you put up, uh, even 25 years ago or 30 years ago, if you had a vote about the European Union in many of the member states, the vote, depending on, of course, how uh, the question is phrased, probably might have been uh, 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 negative. So the elites uh, supported the business, el business elites, intellectual elites, and others to overcome the, uh, the wars of the past. It's, it's very important to to, to recall that, in, uh, uh, that prior to the end of World War II, uh, more wars had been fought between France and Germany than any other two countries in the world. Mm. And look at them now, how well they get along. It is an amazing story, but it is an elite story. Mm. It is not uh, very, much, very much else. The third point I would say is that there is a basic structural inequality in the, in the EU, the size of the member states, the de their development, their history, their culture. It's very difficult to integrate them and bring them all together. And now, fourthly, you can add to that the problem of the new member states, which, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, are new members. And therefore, to uh, assimilate them into the mentality of, mm. uh, of, of the European Union mm. is, uh, is extremely uh, 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 difficult. Now, what about these new uh, Eastern members? The institutional adjustment uh, has been made. Uh, they attend the meetings. They adjusted their institutions. Uh, there are problems constantly. You know, I think uh, Hungary has received uh, two, three hundred uh, suggestions from uh, various European institutions to make this adjustment in the judicial system or that. And the other countries have uh, pretty much the same way. Don't uh, uh, you know, pick, pick only on uh, Hungary in this respect, though it may well be uh, a very difficult uh, case. 
The problem is not so much in the institutional arrangements. It is in the culture. Mm. It's, it's the political minds that mm. have not changed. So, uh, you know, the Poles, um, <laughs> I would say a majority, uh, say Poland for the Poles, mm. Hungary for the Hungarians, Slovakia uh, uh, says we want only Christians in Europe. Mm. Uh, the uh, former Estonian foreign minister even went f further. Foreign minister went even further, and Estonia is one of the better new members of the European Union. And she said, uh, she said that uh, only whites uh, should be there. Now, much of society jumped on them for sure, uh, but, uh, but it was still said, and it is a commonly held view, and not only in, in Estonia. Mm. In other words, watch, uh, watch what's in their heads, not so much what <laughs> institutions they build. Against this background, uh, the, the, uh, the Hungarians uh, got uh, most criticism. The fence they built was atrocious, but a fence had to be built. Uh, some kind of control, external control over uh, around the EU had to be, I believe, had to be built. Uh, the problem was not so much that it was built, but how it was built, what kind of fence it was, and how the refugees uh, 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 were treated. I, uh, I'm sure many of you saw the pictures of these refugees at the uh, Eastern Railway Station in Budapest, where I believe purposefully they were kicked outside and, and, uh, and uh, looked like the horde, which is what I believe the government wanted it to look like so that they could reach out to the right-wing party further to the right. It's a right-wing government, but there is a far-right uh, pa party there is challenging them. Um, as in Poland, by the way, or very similarly to Poland. And so therefore, the issue wa was a domestic political game in order to get the support of far-right uh, supporters. I believe this is what's happening in a smaller <laughs> way in Slovakia, mm. in uh, Croatia too, though that, that's a slightly different story, and the Czech Republic, which mm. we used to think <laughs> would be the best candidate for a truly democratic, Western-oriented uh, society. Yeah. So I know my time is up here. Mm. I just want to mention the conspiracy theories that accompany, because this has not been written up in English very much, the conspiracy theories that are rampant all over Central and Eastern mm. Europe I, I just uh, I read up on this, and uh, some of them say that uh, the refugees are sent, are sent uh, to uh, uh, Europe uh, by Americans, particularly George Soros, uh, <laughs> you know, who has the disadvantage of being American, rich, and Jewish, and so therefore, as a cons target of conspiracy theory, uh, he, he is fantastic. He's a wonderful target. Yeah. Uh, uh, for these, these mindless uh, 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 people. Yeah. And so America yeah. is seen, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say, as being behind uh, this refugee mm. crisis by those yeah. who would like to keep uh, their nation states pure, as <laughs> I guess it used to be. The difference is this, these people are in a majority in Central and Eastern Europe, while in uh, much of Western Europe, uh, even in Germany, they are in a in a minority, and that is very dangerous for the European Union. Yeah. Well, thank you, Charles. Uh, I want to pick up on something that you said about border control and border issues. Um, uh, the border-free Europe, uh, if it's going to survive, requires some external border, some external control. So, I wanted to ask. Uh, uh, Captain Brian Lisko, if, if he could reflect a little bit on his experiences there. Uh, what do you think about the border issue, uh, the question of the Mediterranean itself and patrolling the Mediterranean, uh, and looking beyond this sort of at the, some of the root causes uh, in, in Africa, North Africa, in the Middle East? Jim, thank you very much. Also, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center for uh, inviting me to participate on today's panel. Uh, what I'll be giving you is more an operator's perspective, and uh, what I'd like to say uh, first off is that the Coast Guard is Western Hemisphere focused, but we are um, globally engaged. So we do have a handful of Coast Guard uh, men and women who are over in Europe and in the Mediterranean, uh, and one even in Africa who are trying to make a difference by working with our allies and partners to improve maritime safety and security. Uh, I will come to the uh, 
border patrolling issue. I'd like to just try to frame this very quickly from an American perspective. Good. What we have experienced, <laughs> say, in 1980 during the Mario boat yep. lift. Yep. Yep. So that was 100,000, a little bit more, Cubans mm -hmm. who fled to the United States. And, and that was absolutely <laughs> overwhelming uh, to our uh, first responders, mm. to our government, to the <laughs> state of Florida. But uh, we did cope with it. And then later in the 90s, in the early 90s, some of you may remember, there was a uh, large uh, Haitian and Cuban mass migrations. Mm -hmm. Now, those migrations were, they were large, uh, 25,000 and 30,000. But <laughs> on one day, the record number of migrants interdicted at sea in the Caribbean then was 3,200. Mm. And as has been stated earlier on this panel, uh, last week, coming into Greece, migrants were coming in 10,000 a day. Uh, that's <laughs> epic proportions. And, and also what I would say, too, is uh, take a look at what that means to smaller countries, someone mm. like Malta that's on cool. the front lines. Mm -hmm. And proportionally speaking, when you look at the populations, one migrant landing in Malta is the equivalent of 750 landing in South Florida. Mm. So when a boat, a small rubber raft uh, that's grossly overloaded, manifestly unsafe with, say, 100 migrants and it's only a 18 or 20 foot dinghy lands in Malta, that's the equivalent of 75,000 migrants landing in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you have concerns. How are we going to accommodate these folks to take a look, uh, make sure they're uh, okay medically, mm. uh, that, they're, uh, that mm. they have food, water, shelter? And that can strap some of these countries very quickly. And then depending on the migrants and if they stay in that country, you can see uh, there's a chance to, to change some of the culture and fabric of that country. And I, I speak to Malta because I was posted as the Coast Guard advisor at our embassy there. Uh, and uh, also, I would also say the migrants, what is very, it's a humanitarian crisis, and the European partners and North Africans, many of them are doing the best they can to respond. But there's also a law enforcement aspect to this, and there's the transnational organized criminal networks that are enabling and are making hundreds of thousands, really millions of dollars uh, transporting these migrants in, in unsafe boats, in unsafe sea states, mm -hmm. and it's just for the, for the money. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. puts people at great risk. And where does that money go? Uh, does it just go to the criminals? Does it go to militias? Does it go to terrorist organizations? So with regard to the border patrolling in the Mediterranean, uh, Having been stationed in Italy and in Malta and knowing a lot of the folks with the uh, European Union Naval Forces, as well as Frontex, which is the European Border Control Agency. Uh, Frontex doesn't own any uh, maritime forces. It coordinates a European response to mm -hmm. protect the external borders of the European Union. Uh, it's a massive undertaking just because of those sheer numbers I've said, but they've gotten very, very good. You're all familiar uh, in late 2013 and then in 2014, there were four incidents where migrant boats sunk uh, with more than a thousand lives lost. And that was tragic. And the Italians really did lead the way and formed the Operation Mare Nostrum where they saved really probably more than 140,000 migrants in the year that that happened. Uh, but they did that by having a lot of ships and aircraft and, and personnel assigned to that central Mediterranean region. So there's probably a cost to that. You know, they may have wanted to be in other places, definitely a financial cost. Mm -hmm. And then with the <coughs> Frontex, uh, right now Mare Nostrum ended. Uh, Frontex has their joint operation Triton in the central Mediterranean because as uh, Kathleen pointed out uh, although the biggest vector right now is coming uh, from the east and in the Aegean Sea you know where you have more than 600,000 have arrived in Greece that vector still exists in the central Mediterranean and there's been more than 140,000 uh, migrants that have come up from Libya uh, heading toward uh, Italy and, and points north. So 
It's a very daunting mm. task. Mm. Frontex is out there. Other EU member states and Schengen-associated countries have uh, uh, provided forces, whether it's planes, boats, debriefing mm -hmm. teams, to try to help the uh, collective European mm -hmm. effort. And uh, I tip my uh, hat to them. And then uh, two more things. One, I would say the, you cannot overlook the impact that this has on merchant shipping. Mm. Uh, the Mediterranean, this particular area in the central Mediterranean is, is really the crossroads of the Mediterranean. When you look at uh, merchant traffic coming out of the Suez Canal and heading toward the Strait of Gibraltar, it goes right through mm. uh, the area where uh, EU naval forces uh, Mediterranean, their Operation Sophia is operating as well as Frontex is operating. So those merchant vessels, uh, they have a responsibility when there's mariners in distress or vessels in distress to render assistance, and they've done a very good job. In fact, 800 times so far this year, merchant vessels <coughs> have diverted to render <coughs> assistance. So the shipping industry uh, is owed a debt of gratitude, but at the same time, there's a cost associated with that because that's taking their vessel off its, its regular service. Uh, there's an economic cost, uh, but they do it, and, and they continue to do that. And, and lastly, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, sometimes people lose track that it is a sea, and the Aegean <laughs> is a sea, and it, it's not like a small lake, and the weather gets very, very challenging and very nasty uh, starting right now in the fall, and, and then in the winter it gets very bad. So uh, it's important that there be those first responders out there, uh, but mm. it's just, mm. uh, it doesn't paint a rosy picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to go one more quick round of questions and then we're, we're gonna open it up to the audience. But I wanna come back first to Kathleen and I, I wanna ask you uh, to talk a bit more about the Refugee Convention itself. Um, uh, explain what the convention uh, involves and what its requirements are. And I want you to, I would like for you, given all your background and uh, work with UNHCR and others, you know, what is the U.S. role in this? What, what, you, what, does, what is the U.S. responsibility in this? You know, I was just in Europe and the Europeans were saying, hey, you know, where is the U.S.? Well, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great question and it's one that I hear a lot as well. <laughs> The core obligation under the 1951 convention is not to return yeah. a refugee to a country where his or her life or freedom would be in danger. That's the language of the convention. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of catch-22 in that from the, from the perspective of a refugee is that there's no right to enter yeah. a country. Yeah. Uh, you have to somehow reach another country's territory in order to claim that protection against not being returned. The uh, legal term is non-refoulement. And, uh, and non-refoulement doesn't sort of enter into the picture um, uh, unless you are in under the jurisdiction of another country. Now, there are lots of controversies over maritime indictments and whether, you know, if a ship flying the flag of your country then obligates your country under the Refugee Convention. No agreement on that. Um, mm. And the U.S. Mm. Supreme Court has said no. Um, mm. In fact, wow. uh, the convention, our convention obligations, in their view, don't apply extraterritorially. Mm. Wow. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot in this primarily maritime crisis. There's a lot of controversy over that. And what that does is is create an incentive for countries to prevent people from landing. Now, fortunately, and to the Europeans' great credit, we have not seen that happening so far in this crisis. We have not seen pushbacks mm -hmm. from the shores of Europe, and God forbid we should ever see that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certainly uh, forces within Europe who would like to see that. <laughs> and the discussions with, uh, with Turkey, um, with other countries of first asylum, are very much aimed at keeping people in the region uh, and, and disrupting these flows to Europe for all kinds of good reasons and, and perhaps some bad ones as well. Now, on the U.S. role, um, you know, I hear this from uh, Europeans all the time, 10,000 refugees <laughs> from Syria this year, really? <laughs> uh, you know, when that's a day's intake uh, last weekend to, to Greece uh, or a day's reception. Wow. 
very important to remember the distinction between asylum seekers and resettled refugees here because the United States is protected by its geography. As Philip said, <laughs> Germany doesn't have the luxury of screening people and deciding who will be accepted and, yeah. uh, and so forth, which, and planning for their reception, which, uh, which we do through our resettlement program. But there's a lot of uh, pressure from uh, U.S. advocacy groups, from refugee resettlement organizations, including the IRC, um, to, uh, for the U.S. to take more. There have been proposals that we should be taking 100,000 Syrians a year. That's almost impossible logistically under our current system. So if that kind of thing is going to happen, we need to change our procedures. Great. Well, I want to quickly turn back to Philip here. and. <clears throat> When I was studying Germany uh, many years ago as a student, I mean, I was told that Germany had this very specific culture, the Volkisch culture, the Volksgemeinschaft, that this is a country based on a very strong cultural identity. Today, uh, your chancellor tells us that Germany has a new political culture. It's called a Willkommenskultur. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear you talk about what you think that means and to say a little more about German leadership on these issues in Europe and getting the EU to respond to the crisis. Yeah, you know, the words like Volkskultur, we don't like them anymore. <laughs> it's a, a, a time which is, uh, thank God, quite a long uh, time ago. But um, what, 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 what the fact is, and this is the interesting, when you observe Germany over the last sort of two decades, you would say that mm. it's, the fact is that Germany has become an immigration society. Yeah, you know? yeah. 20% of Germans have at least one non-German parent, which is per capita more than the U.S. even. Yeah? Yeah. So we, we are clearly an immigration society. And I think <laughs> now political parties from the right, more conservative political parties that, you know, in the U.S. they wouldn't uh, qualify as conservative <laughs> parties, but they're the more conservative parties in Germany <laughs> now come, has, have come to terms with this and yeah. they now yeah. see that yeah. um, we are an immigration society. And everybody in Germany sees that we need immigration. We have a very bad birth rate. We have 1.4, which is very bad. It's, um, it's, uh, we are shrinking demographically, <laughs> um, and, and therefore we need migration. Now, need to need migration and getting a million refugees in six <laughs> months is a different, uh, different cup of tea. You know, I mean, that doesn't mean that their profiles match with what we need. It's yeah. not, yeah. We, of course, we would yeah. like to have a Canadian approach, you know, yeah. protected by geography, as you say, <laughs> um, uh, to pick the uh, midwives and the welders we really need. We can't do that. We, have, we don't have the privileges. Our ge geographical situation doesn't allow it us to do so. But what we have, we have to work with what we get now. And, and, and I think, you know, I was quite encouraged to hear Dieter Zetsche from SE to say, you know, let's try to, to make the best of it. Mm. But, um, I think that generally speaking, all European countries and particularly the one in Central and Eastern Europe <laughs> should be aware of their shrinking democracy. Yes. Poland has a birth a worse birth rate than Germany. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and and um, I understand to a certain extent, you know, that countries who found their freedom just 20 years ago, 25 years ago, again, and are very homogenous and much more culturally unified than Germany over the last 50 years, have a problem <laughs> with opening up to refugees. I understand that. And it's, it's a difficult process. And it took us decades to understand yeah, that, we, yeah. that we are an immigration society. But then, you know, times have, uh, are moving quicker anyway. So you, <laughs> I think bet, you better get prepared for the fact <laughs> that you need immigration and you, you have to prepare for that. I don't expect, uh, you know, Slovakia or Czech Republic, you know, the, the countries you mentioned, to take the same percentage of refugees Germany takes. It's, it's, not, it's an illusion. But the sort of the total blocking of refugees in or, uh, because of it is a danger to the culture or the, to the values. I think that's also a wrong, uh, wrong. It's wrong politics, and we should, mm -hmm. you know, for 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 in their national interest, wrong politics. Not only because there is a lack of European solidarity, solidarity which we deplore, but also from a national point of view, they should be much more open-minded to to mm -hmm. when it comes to immigration. You know. Well, Charles, I uh, to come back to you, um, the. Uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban accused Germany of moral imperialism. You know, wh what was he talking about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> could, could you ask an easier one? <laughs> uh, I think what he must have had in mind, we have not talked lately. Uh, <laughs> 
we used to in the 1990s, actually, uh, well. a lot. Um, uh, I think what he, he what what um, he must have had in mind was that there are certain national interests as opposed to universal uh, moral values and humanitarian approaches, and the national interest dictates by his standard by his standard is that uh, uh, that the, these countries remain homogeneous. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what we're talking about. They don't want anybody who is not like them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, uh, and, and when, when um, uh, Chancellor Merkel, whom, as you can tell, I admire, <laughs> uh, uh, said that, uh, that um, uh, these refugees are welcome, as mm -hmm. you mentioned the phrase too, are welcome in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, Orban thought that was an invitation yeah. Yeah. for them to come and for more to come and millions to come, and he did not think that uh, that uh, uh, the individual countries in the European Union are prepared to uh, 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 to embrace them and to to admit them. Now, this is the best interpretation I can give. You. <laughs> okay. If you want to hear what I really think, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk after the session. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is uh, on the record, as we, we all know. Well, uh, one final question for uh, Captain Lisko, and then, then we're going to open it up for your questions. Um, I, I'd like to hear you say a little bit more about, you know, the border control issue in Europe and how the Europeans are dealing with this. Because uh, uh, we talked about Schengen earlier. I assume everyone in this room understands what Schengen is. Uh, it is uh, a remarkable accomplishment uh, for those of you like me who are old enough to remember the days when you traveled in Europe and you couldn't cross a national border without having your papers checked. Uh, the Europeans have constructed a border-free Europe. Uh, but the deal was, if you're going to have these internal borders uh, eliminated, uh, you've got to have external border control. And uh, Frontex is just a skeletal operation, as I understand it. They have very, very few assets. Uh, so, I mean, how are the Europeans going to get a handle on these border questions, do you think? Well, Jim, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Frontex is out there. You know, we have the luxury in the United <laughs> States of having a U.S. Coast Guard, having Customs and Border Protection, yeah. having federal agencies yeah. with broad authorities and responsibilities. But Although you have the European Union, you still have those sovereignty issues with each state, if you will. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, <laughs> it's challenging. It's very challenging. Uh, and, and I'm not really the best qualified person to speak to that. You know, I'm more at the operator level. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I look at and we look at in the U.S. Coast Guard are the, the push and pull factors oh, mm -hmm. that are associated with migration mm -hmm. flows. Mm -hmm. and, and so... When we look, uh, say, to Africa, where we're engaged through Coast Guard mobile training teams and w African Navy and Coast Guard partners coming to the U.S. to mm -hmm. do Coast Guard training in really uh, what I would say maritime governance. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. good maritime law enforcement, through search and rescue, through port security. Mm -hmm. Because if we can help, say, sub-Saharan African mm -hmm. coastal states... Mm -hmm. Uh, with their economic development, which mm -hmm. maritime trade and a safe and secure marine mm -hmm. transportation mm -hmm. system affords them, uh, then maybe they won't feel the need to leave their country. And, mm -hmm. and I'll just give one example. There's mm -hmm. a West African coastal state that uh, historically had a lot of illegal uh, uh, fishing that was going on in their exclusive economic zone. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of uh, effects that had. Uh, the country was not receiving the revenue for fishing licenses because it was illegal yep. fishing. Yeah. So they lost the revenue. Their local fishing fleets were either unemployed or underemployed mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the stocks were being <laughs> taken. Yep. They couldn't get to the fish mm -hmm. stocks. Mm -hmm. There was a food security issue because in that particular country, a majority of the protein that the citizens got came from fish. Yeah. So when you have that perfect storm, if you will, that led some of the mm -hmm. citizens to try to depart mm -hmm. and, and head to Europe and, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, mass migration. So 
Yeah, I, I wanted to get you to tell the audience what you were talking about before we started. You were talking about Libya <clears throat> in particular <clears throat> and how the smuggling operations are working in Libya. Could you say more, I mean, just to use Libya as an example of what's, what's going on there on the coast? Well, I would say just the European <laughs> Union did have a capacity-building mission in Libya, and they were trying to help their Navy and Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. But the conditions became... Uh, uh, they were no longer permissive and they had to leave. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the past, you know, Libyan Coast Guard has been uh, trained by uh, Western countries, uh, but right now when you have uh, no effective border control, yeah, yeah. it makes it very difficult. So just <laughs> that vector of 140,000 plus people coming basically from the North Central Africa, from mm -hmm. Libya, mm -hmm. uh, you don't know where that money's going. You yeah. just don't know who's mm -hmm. facilitating that mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that... Uh, but you described the smugglers a little like travel agents, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, this is definitely, when organized crime is involved, transnational organized crime, uh, they want to make things as easy as they can yeah. uh, for their, really, their victims, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it it's almost like a travel agency, mm -hmm. and if you want to go from point A to point B, you pay your money and, yeah. and do it. Yeah. Can, can I answer that yes, on Schengen? Absolutely. Because this is something. Absolutely. You, you, <laughs> I'm, I'm very <laughs> amazed that you think that everybody knows what Schengen is. I think even in Europe, people <laughs> would not know what Schengen is. Actually. Well, the, the British often refer to it derisively as Schengen land. Uh, yeah, Schengen land, yeah. <laughs> it's like the Alaskans would say the lower 48. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I think that the, what, what we've seen is a desperate attempt to try to secure our borders. Now, Hungary set up the Sphinx with its border to Serbia, which is not a member of the European Union, and the, the Greeks have tried to, to secure the borders. The, f the fact is, and we have to accept the fact that if people, um, for whatever reasons, are trying to walk through the Balkans and through Greece, yeah. and if there are 200, 300, 400,000 people walking, Border protection is comes to a certain end. You know, I mean, yeah. there's nothing that imagine the the the, the, the pictures. You know, yeah. and you have seen that in yeah. in on yeah. the Hungarian Serbian border where people sit in the mud. Hundred thousand people sit in front of a border in the mud. What do you do? <laughs> what is what is what what is a border protection worth in this case? Figure or imagine that Honduras has a major catastrophe and and half its population moves through Mexico to the U.S. What, what, what is happening at the border in the yeah. U.S., in the yeah. south of, 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 of the U.S.? You, you'll, you'll, you'll have to cope with the influx without, you know, but securing the border is, can only go so far. So mm -hmm. what, what, what the European Union now tries to do is, um, is, is setting up this registration centers yeah. Yeah, yeah. where you channel, and this is, we call them hotspots for reasons I never understood, but okay, um, they are in Greece and Italy, and you try to channel the refugee influx through these registration centers where you get registered, and that means at the same time that you are, if you are, you know, if you are really a refugee, you are entitled to asylum or to a refugee status. Right. That means at the same time that if you are not re refugees, because we have many of them also, mm -hmm. that you might be sent back. Yeah? Sure. We have Kat Kathleen wanted yeah. to add something to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, that, that's, uh, that's a very good description. The, one of the problems in Europe is that the non-refugees are not sent back mm -hmm. in, in great numbers. I mean, um, mm. I think it's sort of pre Pre this crisis, only about 40 percent of failed asylum seekers were actually being returned. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably much higher now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, asylum uh, the asylum systems are so overwhelmed that mm -hmm. people are not moving very quickly through that system. But the, the problem that, uh, and it's not easy, uh, that Europeans have with returning people who are not entitled to international protection is is one of the factors um, that they're trying to come to grips with. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's really a very difficult one. People have family ties. People have supportive communities, mm -hmm. you know, dragging people out of their beds in the middle of the night and putting them in chains on a plane. Mm -hmm. It's not, not a good optic. Mm -hmm. So that's a really difficult problem. Okay. Well, the audience has been incredibly patient. So let's open it up now for questions. I see this gentleman right over here has a question. And if you could keep your questions brief to the point, no speeches, please, um, then we'll have a chance to get the reaction of the panel. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, as I watch the news of the refugee crisis and listen to the comments of the panel, 
I can't help but think of the response of European nations and the United States and Great Britain to the efforts of European Jews to escape the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether any of you have thought of that parallel in your own work. Mm -hmm. Of I, course. Um. I can say that this is certainly uh, something which is so strongly in our mind that, that that will always direct German politics. You know, it's something which is very, very clearly uh, one of the numerous reasons why we would not close up our country to refugees. Yeah. Let me emphasize here that the UK is part of Europe, though. That's very important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to the gentleman back here, and then we'll come down here. Yes, this gentleman in the back here. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Nia Kwete. I am an immigrant from, um, from Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, and my concern when I look at the crisis in um, uh, Europe, and I sympathize with what the Europeans have to go through, it seems to me that everybody is forgetting, and therefore I thank Captain L uh, Lisko, everybody is forgetting the Libyan part of it, mm. and that the European Union, especially Britain and France, intervened. And they help to break Libya. And as um, our former Secretary of State says, you break it, you own it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, I would like some comments on why the African um, refugees trying to get to Europe through the Central European, I mean, uh, Mediterranean, are getting far less attention. Uh, President Obama said at the UN that he confessed that the intervention in Libya was not handled well. But when he's increasing the refugees um, to come to the U.S., he doesn't mention the Libyans at all. So I think there is a blind spot where the Libyans are concerned, and uh, if the panel can share some thoughts on that, I'll appreciate it. Thank you. Kathleen? Yeah, um, well, of course, very few of the refugees coming through Libya are Libyan. Uh, they're coming from points further south uh, in Africa. Uh, the sea arrivals to Italy, the, about a quarter are from Eritrea, probably another 15% from Nigeria, and then Sudan, Gambia, Bangladesh, Mali, Senegal, Ghana, and Syria. So, I mean, you know, of those, all but two of those countries are sub-Saharan African. And many of them are not considered people seeking protection from many of those countries, Senegal, Ghana, uh, this Gambia, yes and no, uh, are, uh, are, are not considered to be prima facie refugees. Their countries are not at war. Mm -hmm. The Eritreans are almost all, their appro asylum approval rates are like over 80% uh, mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. Syrians over 90%, obviously. And Somalians and Sudan Sudanese and, um, and Somalis, Somali, Sudanese, Eritreans are, are among the, the top groups. Uh, and they, they are regarded probably more than half um, get, get asylum. The problem with the Libyan departure is that they're almost all from Western Libya, which is not controlled by the Libyan government that we talk to, but by the Islamic Libyan government. And that coast is lawless. Mm -hmm. there, and we don't have the power, the Europeans don't have the power, nobody so far has the power to bring order to that. So it is, it is really the Wild West, worse than the Wild West. And um, that, that is really the problem. I will say that the numbers coming along that route have That's declined so, yeah, down, right? uh, from, compared to last year, as opposed to the Aegean route to Greece, yeah. where it's increased by over 1,000% since mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some logic to the, the focus on Greece, but that's no excuse for, um, for ignoring the, the central...
the other Syrian, uh, the, the Syrian, Afghan, and the Iraqi. Refugees. Let's go to this gentleman right down here on the front row, and then Bill, and we'll just keep going around oh. as fast as we can here. Yes, ta let's take this question here, please. My name is David Loudon. I'm a 40-year analyst, uh, and um, uh, I have a very easy question for you. Um, <laughs> it seems that uh, the West and Europe has uh, been forced just by sheer numbers to be reactive. How do we get ahead of this power curve <clears throat> and and address it in a, in a humane way? And for, uh, for uh, Mr. Gotti, uh, on the issue of conspiracy theories, uh, one of the conspiracies, or at least uh, talking points that have been uh, floated is that uh, uh, Syria is actively supporting the uh, uh, the egress of uh, Syrian Sunnis so that, uh, one, he gets rid of a problem, <laughs> and two, he can repopulate those areas with very uh, mm. Alouette-friendly uh, peoples. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who would like to include the Christian question. minorities in Syria, by the way. Well, conspiracy theories are absolutely all over the place. There is no day when I cannot read a new one. This is uh, what you mentioned is, is uh, just uh, uh, one of them. Uh, it is a habit in Russia and, uh, and in, in Eastern Europe to, to look under the rug <laughs> and look for a reason other than the one that's given. Now, many times this is true. I don't uh, I deny that. I also work for the U.S. government, so I have some idea about what uh, <laughs> is, is going on as opposed to what is being said. Um, uh, so uh, <laughs> not all of these are fantasies, but the one that you mentioned and the one that I refer to obviously are false and, and actually uh, uh, ridiculous. Uh, if I may, Jim, I would like to make a comment about the, a, a previous question about, mm -hmm. the, sure. holo about sure. the Holocaust. Sure. Because it is a very important uh, uh, question in Eastern Europe and especially in Hungary. For while Germany has come to terms with its role and acknowledged the horrors uh, 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 that it brought to the world, some of its uh, World War II supporters uh, have not admitted any responsibility whatsoever. Mm. Uh, in fact, they say they too were victims. Mm. So in uh, Hungary, for example, there is a new uh, statue right in the middle of the city, which I saw, uh, which makes no distinction between, uh, between the six, almost 600,000 Jews killed uh, uh, with Hungarian assistance during World War II on the one hand and the Hungarians themselves who were invaded by uh, Germany on March 19, 1944. Uh, this bringing them together in itself is an outrage uh, because uh, they were willing uh, as the title of a, a different kind of book said, they were willing executioners. And the Hungarian participation in the deportation of those Jews was ex ex mm. extensive, mm. Uh, uh, ju uh, uh, comparable to what the Germans uh, uh, were doing. So if you don't come to terms mm. yep. with what you did, mm -hmm. then, of course, your response <laughs> to the new uh, immigrants, the new refugees, the new uh, uh, people who look for a better life, obviously, will be altogether different. Mm. And Hungary is not alone in this respect. Mm. Uh, and, uh, of course, anti-Semitism is pervasive. Yes. Uh, let's go to the lady right here on the front r front row. This lady right here. You you had your hand up. Yep. And there's a microphone coming. I think. Um, Marta Verbatic. Um, I was teaching a um, lot European Union classes mm -hmm. and Europe, and I'm originally from Croatia. And I think this is important because I've seen these refugees, and I think there is actually a lot of sympathy in those countries like Croatia and Serbia and Macedonia about the refugee flows because we went through this. But these refugee flows during the wars of 1990s, yes. but these refugee flows are or migrant flows are rather different than what we have seen in 1990s. In mm -hmm. 1990s, we've seen women and kids mm -hmm. and people unhappy for leaving their homes and hoping to come back. Now we see 70% of young men of fighting age and 15% women and 15% mm -hmm. of kids. Mm -hmm. And most of these people do, are not even interested in asylum mm -hmm. in any of these so-called safe countries. Mm -hmm. 
of low economic opportunity like Greece, mm -hmm. like Slovenia, like Croatia. In fact, they start rioting in Slovenia. They, they put, uh, burn tents because they want to get to Germany as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And so they cross through several safe countries and understand mm -hmm. they're fleeing the life of despair. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of sympathy for, this, for their plight. But my question to you is, how, to Ms. Newland, how do you see this situation? Because I think it might endanger the current a mechanism we have for the refugee protection because of this confusion between what is a migrant and what is a refugee. Mm -hmm. And how do you treat in this situation a refugee and migrant? Because you can return a refugee to other countries. Mm -hmm. And just if I might say to Mr. Ackerman, um, I understand about European solidarity and all of this, but I think the problem in, within Europe is that many see uh, that, and this is not just part of the Eastern Europe, that this crisis, migrant crisis, was partly triggered by German policy mm. of suspending <laughs> European mechanisms mm. for asylum, mm. and that therefore, um, Dublin yeah. and so on, yeah. and that therefore there was a rush mm. to get to Germany mm -hmm. before Germany closes its mm -hmm. borders. Mm -hmm. So how do you foresee now the future? Because, you know, this migrant flow has also exposed the Balkan countries to lots of problems. Mm -hmm. And I know that Merkel is under pressure to put limit to the number of refugees, especially from his Bavarian coalition. Okay. How do you see okay. the future of German policy? Okay, so the, the Dublin, I knew Dublin would come up eventually, Dublin Convention, and of course the whole issue of moral hazard which she raises, so uh, who would like to start? Well, um, it's, it's, you raised some very, some very good questions, and I think you've articulated some of the contradictions that are inherent in uh, among EU countries where uh, people want to go to Germany or Sweden um, because they are uh, economically vibrant and they don't want to stay in Eastern Europe, but they also want to go to a welcoming country. And so there's the contradiction. You know, people don't want to stay in Hungary because <laughs> Hungarians are hostile to refugees. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the the unwillingness to accept refugees on the part of many uh, Euro of the EU members has reinforced this this uh, dilemma where there are only a few countries that are seen as welcoming and refugees are rational people. Mm -hmm. um, they want to be able to earn a living. Mm -hmm. On the subject of the fact that 70% are young men, this is very often a household decision to send the young men um, because they seem to be hardier, <laughs> uh, more likely to, uh, more willing and more to take the risk and more likely to survive the journey. And there's hope for family unity, also more likely to be able to work and send money back to the family. So that's a, again, that's a rational household decision. It's not that these young men are saying, I'm going to leave the women and children behind um, and go out on my own. They are doing what they think is best for their families. 92% of the refugees in Europe say they want to go back to Syria as soon as possible. Now, you know, they may change their minds if the moment comes, but at this point, that that is their objective, and I think uh, that possibilities for uh, temporary protection are probably one of the things that will come on the menu, as it was in the case of, of the Balkan uh, uh, refugees in Germany in the 90s. If I could just say one more thing, Jim, about, um, you know, I, I mentioned at the end of my opening remarks about the need to open alternative legal channels yep. for people yep. to move. Yep. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now, and as Philip alluded to, is European countries are going in just the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. You know, they're probably going to be cutting down on labor migration because they can fill their neighbor, labor needs from among the refugee mm -hmm. populations. They are cutting down, uh, cracking down on family reunification because they feel, over, feel overwhelmed. This will just feed in mm -hmm. to the illegal movements mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, something's got to got to crack that. Excellent point. Uh, uh, Philip, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, future of German politics is a <laughs> very, very long question, but I'm confident, <laughs> let me tell you. So it's not going to uh, break down. But I, what I would single out here a bit is, you know, the, the, the argument that the Germans invited them. This is a cynical argument, and I flat out think it's a wrong argument. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that being, and that's Kathleen said that at the very beginning, 
these people are desperate. They mm -hmm. flee their home because they don't see any future at home. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not that we have um, an invitation extended to Syrians and say, please come to Germany. Um, we are happy to uh, f uh, provide you with a house and a job and, 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 and a Mercedes car. No, this is not the case. These people, <laughs> they sleep in shelters and they <laughs> on the ground and they, have, they are in, in very, very difficult circumstances. And you know what? It's not a secret that these people know exactly through their smartphones what, what's going to expect them. Huh? Um, so I think that uh, if people are desperate, um, um, they find their way. Uh, and um, and it's, in a way, refugee moves are like water. When you put one <laughs> border up, they find other ways. Yeah. Uh, and um, the Dublin system, which you alluded to, actually is very good for Germany <laughs> because in this <laughs> system, right. nobody has the right to come to Germany. Yeah. Uh, they must stay in Croatia, for example, because the first country... It, could you just explain Dublin to... Yeah, the, to the Dublin or Greece or wherever they come, on which coast they come. Yeah, Greece, I think even Croatia wouldn't like Greece to be overwhelmed with millions of refugees. It's a very fragile country. You know? mm -hmm. So the, the fact that... Um, the, 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 the fact that the Dublin system is when you... The first country in the European Union you set foot on is the country where you seek <laughs> asylum, where you ask for asylum. And this is the country that has to decide and you have to stay in this country. Yeah. Now, the Germans never said, this, said openly that they set the rule of science. What they did is they did it in fact. And factually, they, yeah. they set the rule yeah. of science. And that is, I think, very good for very many uh, countries on the road to Germany, including Croatia. Uh, but um, how many of the refugees were staying in Greece and Italy before this? I mean, <laughs> Italy more than in Greece, but, you know, the Greece is, is I, I think we have all seen what Greece is going through right now, and nobody wants Greece to to falter because of, of, of a refugee uh, uh, bomb uh, being placed on them. So I think that, that um, of course, there is an avalanche effect. Huh? That's clear that people are you know, following the, the, the ones who... But don't get uh, the, the wrong idea that uh, refugees in Germany are welcomed with open arms and, and, and mm. get, uh, get uh, wonderful flats right away. They <laughs> are in a very, very difficult situation. Right <laughs> and they know it. They know it. It's not, they are not, they are not, they are, ex, ex, they are well aware of what expects them. Mm -hmm. So I think the, this invitation argument is particularly cynical because it, it, it belittles the refugees that, that mm -hmm. flee out of despair. Uh, mm -hmm. it's this, it's, they are desperate. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the reason why they are. And it gets the countries that are saying no refugees here off the hook. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. they all want to go to Germany. So just uh, be patient. I'm going to go keep going around. And I think, May I just uh, add I think something? We, yeah, I think we still have uh, uh, quite a bit of time. So uh, if you just hang on, I'll get to you as fast as I can. Uh, and uh, Professor Gaddy wants to add something quickly, briefly. Yes, two, two complications I'd like to call attention to. One is that uh, uh, it's, it, it's somewhat misleading to talk about countries as if they were all good or all bad. Ooh. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very important to keep in mind, we're talking about majorities and minorities, <coughs> yeah. and they do differ from country to country, very complicated. Yeah. Even Germany, which yeah. I have uh, uh, spent considerable time praising here today, <laughs> um, the coalition partners, the CSU, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, is, uh, is, is not only fighting uh, Merkel, uh, uh, on this, but welcomed uh, uh, Viktor Orban mm -hmm. in Bavaria mm -hmm. uh, just what uh, a, a week ago. He he, Orban is their hero. So even <laughs> even Germany, yeah. uh, there there is an issue there. Mm -hmm. And the Hungarians, well, uh, we I know Americans are unified on all these issues. <laughs> uh, right, exactly. Well, that's a very good point <laughs> to keep in mind. Uh, uh, <laughs> but even the Hungarians, I mean, I saw many civil organizations and individuals handing out blankets and bringing food and, and whatever, in, in, you know, in a reasonably, you know, poor country. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were, they were mm -hmm. going out of their way to be helpful. The other complication is that the refugees all want to go to Germany. Uh, they don't want to go to Lithuania, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, how do you Lithuania. send somebody where so they how don't want to go? Do, yeah. How do you do this? I don't have the answer, but uh, it's an important question to mm -hmm. keep in mind. But if Lithuania made itself more welcoming, yeah, that, they might that go, would change. They might go to Lithuania. I think Dr. Bill Friend here in the middle, and this gentleman, that lady, we'll just keep going around, the, and we'll get to you uh, in just a moment. Um, Bill is in the middle here, <laughs> right there. Um, <coughs> Philip Ackermann mentioned, uh, speak in the microphone, Bill. mentioned the fact that Germany has already received something like 700,000 out of the extraordinary figure of 800,000 that Frau Melko represented. But there's an enormous res reservoir of potential 
refugees in Turkey, in Lebanon, <laughs> in Jordan, and of course displaced Syrians mm. who are, I suppose, in even more wretched camps perhaps than they are elsewhere. And this must come to many more millions. Uh, what is the situation for handling this? Some of the countries in Europe, for example, haven't done anything. <laughs> the one, I haven't heard anything about France, which is the second biggest European <laughs> country. Um, I think that François Hollande has made nice noises, but I haven't heard any policy. Um, but what There's probably can a reason be for done that. <laughs> now, what can be done in the next, let us say, two years yeah. to stem yeah. this yeah. in the countries yeah. where these people are yeah. and possibly move towards some sort of political situation so this 92 percent who would like to go back will at least consider going back mm -hmm. okay that's a tough question who would like to take it on who would like to take it on <laughs> philip Le leaving one's home is i think a huge decision you know i mean we have seen that um, in, in during the war and after the war that leaving home is is a is an emotion an extremely strong um, feeling so i'm not surprised that so many people want to go back because it's syria is still their home um, and i think some might but you know if you ask me what what to do 12 million syrians are refugees right now, 12 million. It's more than half of the population's population. And 2 million are in Turkey, 1 point something in Lebanon, 1 million in Jordan, and the rest is displaced inside Syria. That's, I think, this roughly yeah, the, the... It's 4 and 7. Yeah, four you, and you, seven. you are better on, on that. But um, uh, So, so the, the, the remedy is you know, to, to stop the conflict in Syria. That's the remedy. I mean, try everything we can mm. to um, mm. to try to to stop the, the war in Syria. And let me say <laughs> at this table that <laughs> this administration is really showing effort and strength here. I mean, we, we see you as Secretary of State doing the utmost to try to come to to a solution and and doing also very original things. The fact that he brought the Iranian and the Saudi min foreign minister together in Vienna last week is a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we'll be that we are close to a solution here, but I think we've seen new diplomatic momentum here and I think we should take care of it. But the only mm -hmm. remedy to this terrible crisis is stop the war in Syria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to show you how people how desperate the refugees in the surrounding countries are. People are already going back to Syria from Jordan and from Lebanon. And before the Russian bombing campaign started, they were going back in you know considerable numbers. The number of refugees in Jordan is actually dropping because mm. people are going back to Syria or leaving for Europe. Now, fewer are going back to Syria because the conflict has intensified. But that's how badly people want to go back, is while the war is still going on, people are going back from the surrounding countries, which I find extraordinary. This gentleman back here has been very patient right on the edge, and then there's another gentleman there. We'll just keep going around. <coughs> yeah, and the lady down in front here, too. I can't see her for the... My name is Henry Precht. Uh, if the remedy is diplomacy in Syria... Why isn't there more activity in Europe to produce some kind of result in Syria? Why isn't there more military engagement in Iraq or Afghanistan to try to calm those places? Why aren't there more aid programs uh, to stem the flow of Eritreans and others who are coming to... Why is the question merely short-term? Why aren't we doing long-term thinking? Mm -hmm. That's okay. a really good question. <laughs> um, well, Eritrea will not accept um, aid. They think they're just fine. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not a conflict or a development problem. It's a repression problem. It's primarily a problem of forced conscription, which is, in effect, forced labor. In the other countries in Africa, I think the answer is that we don't really know how to do development effectively. Um, there are governance issues that are, you know, beyond uh, the donor's ability to uh, to fix. Um, there are, are um, you know, just massive obstacles to development, and development tends to be self-starting. So I don't think, you know, more aid is, I would advocate for it strongly, but it is not, it, it, uh, in itself, it's not going to solve the problem, nor, I think, is military intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, Just a sentence. Uh, back in the 1990s, I served 
is a senior member of the policy planning staff. Mind the title, policy planning staff of the <laughs> Department of State. And I can tell you categorically <laughs> that there, there is no such thing as long-term planning. <laughs> period. Let's come down here to the front to this lady on the front who's been very patient here. Yeah, And then we'll go to the back over there and back here with this gentleman. Thanks. Um, I'm a congressional journalist, and so I cover law and y your immigration law. And you're, you're right. The, 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 these, um, the, these migrants do not have the right to invade another country's borders. But there's such deep compassion and uh, almost political correctness, it seems, that, that we're not allowed to use rhetoric that would reflect um, laws. But we, I think as it, here in the United States, we have to look at the pull factor as well as the push factors. And, and definitely it seems that when the migrants are rescued and brought to Europe, that is a great reward for their efforts. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was in Albania a couple of years ago. It's a very sparsely populated country. It's half Christian, half Muslim. They want very much to engender goodwill with the European Union. They're, they're developing their coastline as in Greece. Why don't we, why doesn't Europe take advantage of countries like Kosovo, pay them huge amounts of money that uh, would allow them to accept and s settle, at least temporarily, uh, many of these Muslim refugees mm -hmm. and not be rewarded by coming to Europe. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone want to tackle that one? Let, let me just answer this very quickly because, you know, the, until summer this year, the biggest number of asylum seekers in Germany came from Kosovo and Albania. So that explains a bit, you know, where we stand here. I think um, these are not countries who deem themselves in a, in a position to, yeah. to, to do that. Um, I, Most I of think them were not getting asylum. I think, it, that, no, no, they are all sent back, all sent back now. Now they are all sent back because of the other. But I, I think that, and Kathleen uh, referred to that um, earlier, I think um, we, we are living in a more and more globalized world. You know, there are push factors and pull factors. <laughs> American universities are a huge pull factor. Yeah? <laughs> lots of German scientists, lots of uh, Russian scientists go to America, American universities. That's a brain drain which is, you know, pulled by. So, and, but that, that's, and, and when people from Ghana and Senegal think their life is better in Europe than in their home states, you know, they are taking the, op the, the risk and the opportunity. Frankly, I don't blame them for that. Uh, I can't blame them for that. Mm. It's very well possible that we, they'll be sent back uh, because they are not asylum seekers. But the fact is that in this globalized world where information exchange is so quickly, we have to, to come to terms with the fact that mobility is a huge, huge um, a problem or a huge factor uh, that, that influences our societies. And I can only say, you know, um, <laughs> America is the best example. Um, uh, the more open a society is, the more um, reason is to believe that it will survive. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, let's just keep going around. I want to. I want to get a couple of questions here, then I'll come back over to you. So the gentleman right here uh, has waited patiently. Then the lady here, and then this lady. I'm Dean Pinellas. I was an international judge in Kosovo, and I would wow. <laughs> second what uh, Ambassador Ackerman said about Kosovo's uh, lack of uh, capacity to handle. Uh, any of the refugees, but, but that's not the point I want to make. So far, the European countries have absorbed 100% uh, of the burden to their credit. My question is, do any of you think that the Arab states, Saudi Arabia, the very wealthy <laughs> Gulf states, have any obligation to step up to the plate? Mm -hmm. And I was particularly struck by the irony mm -hmm several weeks ago when Saudi Arabia hosted the annual Hajj. Now, of course, it was a catastrophe uh, uh, during the Hajj, but it, it struck me that Saudi Arabia has the infrastructure and the ability to handle millions of people at mm. the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to mm. whether there's any justification for mm. Saudi Arabia not taking on any of the obligation, and perhaps it's the tiresome uh, uh, Sunni-Shiite divide. Mm. But <laughs> when you look at Europe, it's historically Christian, but Europe is welcoming 
uh, people of the uh, of the Muslim faith, which is a wonderful thing. So why can't the uh, other folks in, in the Gulf step up? Because they are all sitting on powder kegs, as you know very well, with their own uh, domestic politics, apart from Saudi Arabia, which is a which is a big country. I mean, the other uh, Gulf states have tiny populations have as much as 75 percent of that population composed of immigrants. Uh, so I th And um, hundreds of thousands of Syrians live and work in the Gulf states. Mm -hmm. um, many uh, middle class and, and wealthy Syrians are li have fled from Syria to Dubai, to Abu Dhabi, um, and you know, other, other places in, in the Gulf. They are not there as refugees, which means that they, they lack the um, you know the the right of non refoulement but um, but they are living and working as Syrians in the Gulf states. Um, none of the Gulf states are signatories to the refugee convention. They don't have refugee laws. There is no legal status of a refugee in any of the Gulf states, <laughs> um, mm. which you know is not excusing them, uh, but explaining you know what what the situation is. So you have lots of Syrians in the Gulf. They're not there as refugees. Um, I think the, the call to account of the Gulf states is much more on fueling the conflicts than on not taking refugees. Mm -hmm. can, can I add sure. a sentence? Sure. I think um, you'd be surprised how little people want to go to, yeah, this, right, to, exactly. uh, to, to these countries. <laughs> um, I have served in the Arab world, and I know that um, these rich Arab countries are hugely unpopular un amongst the other Arab countries. <laughs> and I think there is a sort of, whether it's correct or not, I'm not to judge, but there is this general feeling that once they are in Saudi Arabia, they would be treated as persons second or third class, you know, not, not having the same access to to provisions by the government or something. So I think if you ask um, the majority of Syrians, they would say, I'd rather go to Europe than to the Gulf. Yeah. Let's go to the lady in the back here, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, right back here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to the question of the US's role in um, <laughs> the European refugee crisis. Um, I have worked in resettlement through the International Rescue Committee for a few years, and I would like to know uh, what are we doing to bolster resettlement programs um, to better prepare them for a potential larger surge if we are advocating for more um, refugee for the US to take in more refugees, especially Syr Syrian refugees? Well, it's... Um uh, as I said before, you know, there's a strong advocacy effort of which uh, the International Rescue Committee is part to, to take more uh, Syrian refugees in particular and more refugees in general. And the U.S. government has, uh, you know, upped the, the resettlement ceiling from 70,000 last year to 85,000 this fiscal year and aiming for 100,000 next year, it's still a drop in the bucket, absolutely a drop in the bucket. Mm. And the resource implications are, are, um, are considerable. Just the uh, vetting, selection, reception, and placement that, you know, which the support that lasts for less than a year for resettled refugees comes to something on the order of $10,000 uh, a person. Um, now that's partly because we make our procedure so complicated. Uh, but, you know, so if we take an extra 10,000 refugees, that's $100 million. That's serious money. Mm. Um, mm. So, you know, there, there really has to be a consensus and a, a willingness on the part of Congress to appropriate those funds or some other ways of dealing with this. The Canadians have a private sponsorship program in which private citizens mm. take on the responsibility for supporting refugees. And I would love to see that happen here. I think there's a tremendous willingness on the part of the US uh, public to do it. And we have done similar things in the past. Um, but we would have to really, there would have to be a serious effort to streamline procedures, particularly mm -hmm. the security procedures, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we put people through four different levels of security screening. There's such risk aversion and such sort of paranoia about the idea, the, in my view, quite silly idea that terrorists would use this extremely heavily scrutinized channel to enter the United States. Just as an aside, we've resettled, since we ramped up 
security procedures for refugees after 9-11. We've resettled 784,000 refugees, and there have been exactly three arrests <laughs> for terrorism-related activities, none of which came anywhere near to completion. So, um, you know, there would have to be a reform of the system to really accommodate more people. We can do it. You know, we resettled 287,000 people in one year from Vietnam. And, right, yeah. um, if the way, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, but there have to be resources. Yeah, Charles. Uh, I realized that was a very different time and different circumstances. Uh, but I'd like to uh, mm -hmm. uh, relate here that in 1957, 56, mm -hmm. 1957, mm -hmm. when I was a refugee, mm -hmm. uh, the quota for Hungarian refugees was about three to 4,000, and that was filled in min practically in minutes in November of 1956 in Vienna. And then President Eisenhower went to Congress and asked for a special quota of 44,000. And that was approved in a few days mm -hmm. by a Congress that is rather different from the one that we now have today. <laughs> uh, and so as a result, I was able to uh, come here. I realized that was the Cold War. Uh, the, the circumstances were very different. But still, this is a different America. And that's my response to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady here has been very patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, could you speak with the microphone there? Oh. I'm Christina Stahlbrand. I want to thank the panel for elucidating these, this intricate problem that's complex. Um, I'm wondering if we could have the, each person on the panel say something about what you mentioned, Mr. Hollifield, at the beginning, about the goal of the Wilson Center mm -hmm. to bring forth mm -hmm. actionable yep. ideas <laughs> and Mr. Ackerman suggested <laughs> we try to end the war in Syria <laughs> and Mr. Gatti uh, gave a, a comment about the woeful inability we have to do any long-range planning. Mm. Those comments notwithstanding, mm. could you well, I think suggest that is, there might that be any actionable ideas? That is a superb ideas? question maybe with which to end the panel and take one final round of comments from our panelists and that would give you a little more time to come up and talk to and interact with the panel uh, individually. Uh, but I think that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, um, uh, uh, we, we brought the uh, George W. Bush Presidential Library to SMU, where I teach, and uh, President Bush said he wanted not a think tank, but an action tank. <laughs> <laughs> he wants action. Let's do things. Let's come up with ideas and put them into action. Now, we could make bad jokes about this, and let's not go there. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what, what are we going to do? I mean, wh what are the Europeans going to do? I mean, the Dublin system, Philip, is broken. Uh, it hasn't worked for decades. Uh, so, you know, what is the new policy going to look like? I mean, if you were asked to design this policy for the commission and to build a consensus, what would it be? <laughs> so that's a different question, Jim, <laughs> <laughs> to start with. It's not... I would say that, um, um, uh, that, that uh, Europe should try to sit down and try to develop an asylum and refugee welcoming policy that is equally distributed according to some um, parameters that had to be d developed. At the end of the day, um, the refugee perhaps would not have the right to decide in which country he or she is going to be um, sent. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but but um, at the end of the day, every refugee could be sure that even if uh, he'd be sent to I don't know, the far <laughs> north like Estonia or the far west like Portugal, he, he, he'd have a, a decent living in, in, the, in, the, in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. That would be great to have mm -hmm. such, a, such a general uh, policy. Um, mm -hmm. We are far from that, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, I think there is not, uh, it will not be imminent, but um, mm -hmm. that, that would be an, an, a policy, I think, that, that, that um, uh, could cope with crises like we are facing. Mm -hmm. Okay, good try. Yeah, Charles? Uh, my answer is uh, uh, not uh, has little to do with the immediate issue at hand, but in the long longer run, uh, I think it is essential for the European Union to work out uh, procedures to penalize members who are not uh, uh, cooperative and who uh, who go far away from the central purposes and standards and spirit of the European Union. Such uh, uh, measures are uh, not only that they don't exist, but even if those that do exist could not be applied because uh, if you penalize Austria, 
as they tried to do um, 15 years ago, uh, then every other country in the union will believe that if they vote for that next time around, they could get the uh, the, the bad uh, treatment. This is the same with Hungary today, especially because it's a member of the EPP group, and uh, and so mm. uh, therefore it's impossible, short of expelling the country, sh- uh, to apply any serious uh, uh, measures. Uh, this way, the European Union, I believe, uh, uh, will face more and more difficulties mm-hmm. unless it changes uh, this, which is not going to be very easy. Captain Lisko, you want to get in on this? Sure, you bet. As far as actionable ideas and in, in what we're doing, I think the Coast Guard will continue to do uh, what we do well, which is uh, subject matter expert exchanges on search and rescue, on on boarding officer training, on, on how to do things mm-hmm. safely, on mm-hmm. on uh, in areas such as uh, evidence collection and investigative techniques. We're working with Department of Homeland Security agencies and some of our European counterparts now doing that. In Malta, mm-hmm. we partner with the Armed Forces of Malta at their search and rescue training center where it prides itself on bringing neighboring countries in for say a one month long search and rescue coordinating class so i've taught at this school and and we've had algerians and tunisian officers in class for a month now they're learning how to properly execute search and rescue operations That's half of it. The other half is that socialization outside of the classroom and getting to know your neighbors because the the International Maritime Organization and the search and rescue system encourages uh, collaborative agreements with your neighboring countries so that it will lead to a more effective um, Mm -hmm. and timely search and rescue response. So Mm -hmm. I I would Mm -hmm. say continuing to do the things we do well, Mm -hmm. search and rescue, maritime law enforcement at sea, and and, and working Mm -hmm. with our North African Mm -hmm. and Southern European partners. Yeah, that is definitely actionable, and it's something the U.S. can contribute in a concrete way. Uh, Kathleen? And it's one of the few bright spots in this whole picture, actually. It's, it's that kind of cooperation that has really brought down the death rates and saved hundreds of thousands of people. Um, uh, I'm trying to think how to be brief on this because <laughs> the Migration Policy Institute has an entire program of right. work on exactly right. uh, that subject. And we are investigating things like... Um, legal channels for mobility for yep. refugees yep. and other forced migrants. It's not so easy to draw a bright line between refugees and, and migrants, as, as those legal categories imply. So opening opportunity through labor market channels, through education and training opportunities for refugees and in countries of first asylum, in countries of destination, and for migrants in their countries of origin. Um, using technology is something that we really are way behind on. There's, there's a great deal more, I believe, that could be done. Um, 80% of refugees have access to a smart, smartphone, uh, to a, a mobile phone, and 40% to a smartphone. I mean, that's one of the real transformations of this whole flow, and we should be able to use that technology in more uh, productive ways. I think more generous attitudes to family reunification, that's something that is actionable, that countries are very worried about, but it is a key to successful integration of uh, of refugees and migrants and um, drawing in diaspora communities where people already have ties and have established themselves is an important aspect of that. I mentioned private sponsorship. I think it's really important to develop Again, a long-term prospect on this, get away from the exclusively emergency response, which is hard at a time like this, but uh, when things calm down a little, we just tend to put it aside and not plan for the next uh, for the next crisis. And we need global solidarity yep. in this. Yep. This is yep. not just a Middle Eastern problem. It's not just a European problem. You know, the United States needs to step up to the plate, but so does Brazil, and so does Thailand, and so do other countries around the world need to be part of a, a sort of comprehensive way of dealing with these global crises. Mm-hmm. And finally, I think it's really important to bring in the private sector, which is a lot better at channeling flows and logistics and employment and all of these issues, a lot better than governments are at dealing with that. So both private sector and civil society need to be brought into that 
Global Compact. Mm -hmm. And uh, go to migrationpolicy.org for more (laughs) and more and more than you can bear on this. Well, I I think it is safe to say that we've had a very intense and enlightening discussion here that all of you who came have learned something today. I hope you will take this back to your workplace and uh, think about it. And uh, uh, let's keep uh, solidarity with the Europeans, with our Middle Eastern uh, friends who are coping with these crises and, uh, uh, you know, just try to keep hope alive, I guess would be the way I would put it. So let's thank the panelists. Thank you, Jim. Please feel free to come up and talk with them.